The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you this day in a spirit of great abundance. We thank you for all of the possibilities that you have put before us, all of the resources that you've put into our hands, and the, most, the greatest resource of all, which is this parish family, bringing its creativity, its ambition, and its skill to bear. We thank you for blessing us over this last year of construction, and we ask your continued blessing as we finish the work that is put before us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome to our progress report, uh, May 12, 2019. Um, that was the sort of unofficial title that we were working on uh, as we were putting this program together today, but I'd like to give it a different title as we have this conversation. The Spirit of Abundance. For so many times when we start to think about how do we sort of connoiter budgets to get them into the right space, how do we pick what we can afford to do and what we can't afford to do, so, so quickly and so easily our mind can start to focus on the things that we aren't able to do or how far we could have gotten if only if. And I don't want us to go there today. I want us to remember back six years ago when you and I started this journey together and we were trying to figure out how we could scrape together some money to do something about the gym. Well, we've done that. We've also then gone to do a complete renovation of all of our uh, ministry facilities, and as I'll be sharing with you in a moment, that work is almost complete. And now we're going forward even further to say, how can we do some work in our nave? As of today, we have more than $10.25 million committed to the Campaign for Holy Communion, and that is not a spirit of scarcity. So many churches would give their left arm to be in the position where we are to be able to invest these kinds of resources in making sure that this church is here to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ on this corner uh, for the indefinite future. We are going to be caught up on all of our deferred maintenance. We are going to be rock solid as we head into the sort of tidal wave of culture change that's going on around us. If any church is positioned for its future, Church of the Holy Communion is, and we need to approach our whole conversation today from a spirit of great abundance. So let that be our theme as we begin. I promised some breaking news, and here it is. We are going to reopen the second and third floor of Blaisdell and Greenwood on June 2nd. Come on, come on. Thank you. You've already seen the floor start to creep out from behind the curtain. We're going to pull that curtain back. We'll have a ribbon cutting on June 2nd, which is a Sunday in the forum hour. Uh, you can go through. You'll be able to see the upper two floors. We're going to need a little bit longer to get the first floor ready, but the upper two floors will be in service. Uh, we are going to move starting on uh, Monday, June the 3rd. So anybody who wants some volunteer opportunity, uh, Mary Ann is going to talk to you in just a moment. But that's going to be our moving week. Uh, and then we'll get settled into those new spaces. We'll open the lower level in mid-June. We have also scheduled Bishop Phoebe Rofe, who has been the bishop of this diocese for all of eight days, uh, to come and be with us on September 8th to bless uh, and rededicate Blaisdell and Greenwood and the Cheney Building, which will be going under renovation this summer. So all of that work we will be uh, finishing up around Labor Day time, and the bishop will be coming on Sunday, uh, September 8th, to make her first visitation to Holy Communion and to bless these buildings back to the glory of God as we start to mark finishings and completions. If you take a quick look at the back of your page, you'll see the financial report for the uh, top section, which is the project that's currently underway, Blaisdell, Greenwood, Cheney, and the Wellness Center. You'll see the results of the first pass of the capital campaign, uh, some bequest money that had been received and was sitting in our accounts. Uh, we used the capital projects fund money uh, to bear. We had some memorial money and some checking account interest, which gives us a total of $8.675 million uh, of revenue for that first phase project. If you look down below, you'll see the costs, and we are running a deficit on that first project. Um, the choice that the vestry had to make in allowing a deficit to go forward was what do we not do? In order to get that deficit back down to a zero balance, we were going to have to do things like not renovate the bathrooms over here by the elevator, build an elevator shaft in Blaisdell but not put an elevator in it. And they were the sorts of choices that just weren't the right ones to make. 
So the vestry has allowed that to carry as a deficit. That, will, um, that number has already shrunk a bit. We're going to sort of watch it go um, as we go. And we will need to figure out what to do with that. The vestry is looking at all of its options, uh, and we have a number of them. And just to put that number into context, $500,000 for Holy Communion is less than one-third of our annual operating budget. It's less than one-third of our unrestricted endowment. Uh, and it's uh, less than, uh, I think, less than half of the debt that we carried on this building, if not even um, further than that. Uh, so we have handled this amount before, uh, and we're looking at all of our options as we explore it. So that's where we are on the project that is before you. Flip back over to the other side, if you would. We have agreed with St. Mary's to a schedule of renovation that has us going into the nave and doing nave restoration this summer and fall, which is a very exciting opportunity. Um, as you know, we had a very grand plan. I, we don't have our pictures here. We'll need to get our pictures back. We have a very grand plan of what we wanted to do in the nave. Uh, and as we started getting a sense of what resources were available, the vestry started right-sizing that project. The plan that the vestry has approved includes replacing the roof, replacing the heating and air conditioning, replacing the electrical, lighting, and amplification systems, completely renovating the narthex, completely renovating the chancel, repairing and improving the ceiling, but not completely re-sculpting it. So it will seem like a brand new church. We'll have great new amplification. We'll have great new lighting. We'll have uh, the roof taken care of. All of those things will be done. If you look on the back of your page, you'll see where we came out on the uh, second phase campaign, which supported NAVE efforts. Thanks to this parish family, after raising $8.1 million in the first phase of the campaign, we brought in another $2.1 million to support work in the NAVE. May I have a round of applause for that? And we have a few parishioners who have graciously made application to their family's charitable foundations. Um, and that number is there, but it's not signed yet, so we're not putting it in the commitments line. Um, if you look, though, you'll see that there is a deficit showing on the NAVE restoration effort. And since there is a deficit on the first, we can't let that happen. So the vestry has determined that we need to raise about $250,000 more in order to do the NAVE as they have scoped it. If we're not able to do that, we're going to need to cut back on the scope so as to get the budget into balance. And Morgan is going to talk about that in a moment. Flip back to the other side. Work in the nave can begin as early as June, and we are ready for that. Uh, we have to give final orders on the scope of the project by the end of June so that the contractors know what they need to buy and plan for and do and all of that. So we have until June 30th. Uh, to close that final gap on the phase two campaign. When I quickly went through all of the things that were covered, you might have been making a little mental list of what is he not saying? It's always good to ask what the clergy are not saying uh, when they make presentations. And there, are, sorry, Jonathan, it's, it's true. Um, there are three projects that are currently not funded in the uh, scope. They are replacing the pews, renovating the sacristy, and enhancing the pipe organ. The vestry has established those three in ranked priority, and you can see the price tags uh, on those there. Um, at the moment, we are targeting to raise the money that we need to close the gap for the NAVE scope. If we are able to do those, we're going to tackle them, but we're not going to uh, incur a greater deficit in order to do them. These are projects that we can come back to pretty easily. I'm going to take uh, a question or two, if there is one. Uh, this is just to get the facts out, and then I'm going to have our uh, lay leaders speak to what we're doing and what comes next. Are there questions as to the facts? Wow. I'm feeling very good about myself. <laughs> Clergy are only trained to be, at, to be able to count to 3, 12, and 40 because those are the only numbers we're supposed to work with. These numbers are bigger than that. Um, one thing that I do want to just celebrate with you, uh, which is remarkable and a sign of the generosity of our parish family, um, as of the end of April, we had received $5.9 million of cash in hand. These are pledges paid, not just pledges made. Um, and that is remarkable. And it has allowed us to pay for everything that we have done up to this point in cash. So as of this moment, Church of the Holy Communion is still debt-free. 
Uh, we have a construction line of credit ready to go that we think we're gonna need to tap probably this month or next. Um, and we were planning to have to tap it in February. So we are really running way ahead of the curve. Uh, if you look at 10 and a quarter million dollars pledged on both campaigns, this is um, more than half paid already and we're only just shy of two years into the campaign uh, payment cycle. So we are really doing quite well and I just wanna thank everybody for really stretching and getting those pledges paid because it has made such a difference that we haven't had to incur any interest up to this point to get our construction bills paid. So thank you to all of you uh, for that. When I met with the vestry about this in April, um, they uh, were very enthusiastic about what was happening and what they wanted to see happen, and they asked me if they could tell you in their own words. So I'm gonna hand off the balance of this presentation to our elected lay leaders, and I want to just offer that it is truly a privilege for a rector to have a leadership team that says we want to carry the ball down the field and get it over the goal line. Um, so I just want to thank all of our elected leaders and appointed leaders in the parish for their commitment, countless hours of service, and just saying we're Holy Communion and we're going to do this. So uh, the first person who will speak is Marianne McDonald, who's chair of the Church Renovations Committee, and she's going to tell us what we can expect in Blaisdell, Greenwood, and Cheney in just a few months' time, a week's time. Thank you, Sandy. Um, I get to do the exciting part, the fun part. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Church Renovation Committee, uh, that being Debbie Campbell, Dan Pogue, uh, <clears throat> Emily Woodside, David Dando, and, Dan and Daniel Amsley, Amsler uh, joined us as we moved into working on the uh, NAVE project. We've met every week for the last uh, we started out meeting every week the first year or so, and now we've backed down, and we meet about once a month now as things are beginning to finish up. We don't have to meet quite as often. But the committee met, and lots of decisions were made, and what I'm seeing in Blaisdell Greenwood is amazing. And I told Sandy, he wanted me to tell you what, what, what you're going to see in a couple of weeks. And I said, great, I'm going to tell him the 25 things they're going to see. He said, oh, no, Mary Ann, don't, don't tell him 25. That takes too long. I said, well, okay, I'll tell them 10 things. I said, I read in the newspaper all the time. That's the new, the new journalism technique, 10 things you need to know about the Tiger football team or 10 things you need to know about, you know, the new health care program. So guess what? You're getting ready to hear 10 things you need to know about Blaisdell and Greenwood. First of all, Blaisdell and Greenwood is going to have a second elevator. An elevator right in the entry in the new, beautiful, welcome, spacious, open welcome center. There will be a second elevator there. Great, the great thing about that is it will also help with the mobility, the uh, uh, being able to move around in the building much more easily, being able to get from point A to B without having to walk so far to get to an elevator, much more uh, <clears throat> uh, easily moved. Emily Woodside, who on our committee was very adamant about that second elevator. So as we talked about it in our committee, we named it the Emily Woodside Elevator. <laughs> so as you pass by, kind of give a nod and say, thanks, Emily. And let me tell you, elevators are not inexpensive. This was a decision, a hard decision. We have a very uh, well-running elevator at this point. Hey, do we need another one? Ask Emily. She says we do. And we now have one, and I think all of us are going to be very thankful that we have that elevator. Secondly, we have a north stairwell. If you've looked as you drive down Walnut Grove, you'll see a little pooch out there, a little um, square that comes out right, right on the front of the building. That's the north stairwell. That was another point that we talked about. It was another, it was another costly uh, item on our uh, agenda. We put in a north stairwell. Why would we put in a north stairwell? Why do we need that? To make it easy to access all of our new mechanical equipment. To be able to get to the heating and air very easily. Dan Pogue, who we know, has a lot of experience in commercial real estate. And of course, David Danda, who's an engineer. Those two weren't going to let us get by without that north stairwell. Now, when we call a repair person, they don't have to come with padded knees to crawl under to repair the heat and air. They can walk right in, 
repair whatever we need, if we need new, if we need anything new, a uh, piece of equipment or anything, they just can walk right in. It's going to make it so much easier to repair and probably less costly in time spent trying to repair. One of the things we wanted to make sure we did, this new building, to be easy to maintain and less expensive. So you'll note there'll be a new stairwell. It will only be used uh, in emergencies and for repairs, but it's going to make a huge difference in how the new building operates. The next thing you're going to notice are new restrooms. Restrooms everywhere. Men's restrooms, ladies' rest, women's restrooms, family restrooms, changing tables, handicap accessible restrooms, lots of them. And they're very beautiful, too. I'm not kidding. I never thought I'd be wanting to brag on restrooms, but let me tell you, the tile, the colors, very, very nice. I think you're going to be really excited to see restrooms. And the next thing you're going to find that we have, I don't know if any of you have heard or not, laundry room. Yep, we've got a laundry room. I think that's just going to be a great asset. In fact, we might want to call that the Mary Ann McDonald laundry room. <laughs> Because I fought pretty hard for that. But it's, we're going to have a washer and dryer, um, you know, commercial sort of up, up, up home grade, between home grade and commercial, where we can do our, our tablecloths and some other linens for the, uh, uh, <clears throat> for the altar gill and other things. We'll have our own laundry room with great storage. What a nice thing to have and be able to help our maintenance staff as well as our altar gill. I'm very excited. Another thing that Debbie Campbell was really excited about, and I think it's going to be so important, is that we're going to have a library on the first floor back behind the Welcome Center. It's going to be a room that will have some bookcases built in it, and this is where we'll have the uh, books that we took out of the library that we wanted, that we selected to keep, and some of our nice artifacts and things that we wanted to save. It will be a comfortable seating room, a room where a family can gather before a funeral, or if there is a crisis and a family wants to come to the church and meet, and yet feel more in a home atmosphere. So um, Debbie was really uh, instrumental in, in bringing that before us and talking with us about how she thought that would be important that we have that as something uh, to include in our new building. Next, we're going to have a coffee bar. Yeah, a real coffee bar in the Welcome Center, a place behind doors that will open up and there'll be coffee there and there'll be a, refriger a small refrigerator where we can offer water and cold drinks to visitors when they come and they have to wait to, when they're gonna be waiting to see someone. So we will have an actual coffee bar, a place for coffee. Um, the other thing, we'll have a second kitchen, the Blaisdale kitchen. Downstairs, uh, there will be a kitchen. It will not be, I've learned a lot through this, it won't be an open flame kitchen, but it will be a serving kitchen with lots of storage space. We'll be able to move out of the Cheney kitchen a lot of our dishes and, and silverware and glassware. We'll be able to store downstairs until we need them. So it's going to be a great um, storage space as well as a good place to heat and warm. We'll have refrigerators, freezers, and warming facilities, but we won't be able to cook down there. But we will have a great backup area for any of our entertaining, our events, and when we need a second kitchen. So that will be all ours before we, you know, sort of when we wanted to use that, we would be working around what St. Mary's had in the Blaisdell kitchen. So we will have our own kitchen. We'll have youth suites. This is something, again, that Dan Pogue was really uh, instrumental in, in pushing for some, some he, he talked about how important it is that our children and youth programs be strong at Holy Communion so that we can grow this church. And so we have a junior high and a senior high youth suite, one on each side on the, down on the first floor, the lower level, with breakout rooms, three breakout rooms. Uh, and great storage for all the things that they have. Mm, they have a lot of stuff, so we have good storage. We have a lot of storage all over this building. I was just really um, adamant about we get some good closets and shelves and storage space to put a lot of our things so that we will be able to keep our rooms really looking, looking good. Uh, so we have the youth suite. Uh, we have the children's area that I'm going to talk about in just a moment. And we also have 
exercise rooms in the new gym. There are going to be two rooms that will be ours to do our exercise programs. We'll have our own exercise rooms. Uh, we're also going to have a choir suite that will be right above here. This area, uh, Carrick Room will stay, but the rest of the third floor of Cheney becomes the choir suite. The other end of the third floor is going to be the administrative suite. This is where the clergy, all the offices are going to be, with breakout rooms and meeting rooms. And I've mentioned all of these things without even talking about just the conference rooms and the classrooms just for training and, and uh, <clears throat> classes that we're going to have. These are all the special things that we're going to have in the new building. It is going to be so beautiful. I've just toured it probably two weeks ago. The colors, the accent colors, the paints, the carpets, the flooring, it's amazing. I mean, you are not, you're going to be amazed when you see it. Uh, just to step outside of the building for a moment, we're going to have a play area. Not necessarily a playground, but a play area. And guess where it's going to be located? Right there. It's going to be located outside of the building, outside of Cheney, right here, so that when the parents are here having coffee, visiting, the children can be close by not way down on the playground, and not way out front on Walnut Grove. They're going to be close by so that parents can feel comfortable and that children can have a space to play in. So we're going to have more of a park-like atmosphere so that it will be more in keeping with our style. Uh, everything is going to just be so, so amazing. I, I can't tell you how beautiful it's going to be. I haven't mentioned the children's chapel because that's one thing that is going to take your breath away when you see what the children's chapel is going to look like. We have these two beautiful stained glass windows. And the children's chapel is, much, is going to mirror somewhat of our new nave. The flooring in the children's chapel is going to, going to mirror the nave flooring. So when the children leave the nave, they will go down the hall and the doors will open to the nave. I mean, to their children's chapel and the nave, they're going to be, the children's chapel and the nave are going to be on the same plane. You'll just, they will be right with us. And I think that's just so meaningful to think that they'll leave the big church, go to their church, and then they'll leave and come back to the big church. And I think that's going to be so special. And Daniel has been so involved with and, and had such insight into the nave and and how it's all going to evolve. And I think we should hear what he has to say, and you'll see where we're headed with that. Daniel? Good morning. I came to the Episcopal Church for the worship. I was raised a Baptist. The only symbols in the small churches I grew up in were a little communion table in the front of the pulpit and a big rectangle in the back of the wall behind the pulpit, a baptistry. I walked into an Episcopal church in Southern California on All Saints Day in 1986. It had candles and crosses an altar with a kneeling rail, an Eucharist, colorful vestments, lots of scripture, beautiful hundreds of year old prayers, a short, relevant sermon. <laughs> Intentional worship all over the place. My spirit was deeply moved. I didn't fully understand it then but I felt like I was home. This is the fourth Episcopal Church I have been a part of in 30 years. It is the best one. You people of God... <clears throat> you people of God here are warm and friendly, open in mind, and devout and passionate of heart. We love it here. Judy and I came here 10 years ago. In 2015, 
I was invited to join a committee looking into the design possibilities for the nave and the chancel. I could not have been offered something that gave me more of the big time tingles than that. <laughs> Terry Bird Eason, doubtless the premier de design resource for especially Episcopal churches, was to be our guide and our inspiration. Terry had designed Virginia Seminary Chapel, Suwannee Chapel, parts of the National Cathedral in Washington, Grace St. Luke's here, and so, many, so much more. The first time Terry came here to Holy Communion, he sat alone quietly in our nave and chancel for well over an hour and let our simple, beautiful place convey itself to him. His journey from the beginning was not to change the architecture and space, but to move it forward into richer and fuller what it is. He had a theological and liturgical and architectural reason for all he suggested. The nave and the chancel are the heart and soul of our church. It is the place and space where we gather to have our spirits moved. It is uniquely the place our lives are taught and challenged and invited to be followers of Christ, where we sing and kneel and confess and rejoice with each other in our Lord's special presence. I don't remember how many meetings we had with Terry in these years, but they were all exciting and enriching. Terry would come with slides and pictures and models of what might be. I stayed excited as our diverse committee looked and talked and imagined and decided on some design features. Keeping with intentional deliberateness of our whole process, Sandy held those wonderful forums where we discussed with us the theological and liturgical bases for the place of worship and its elements. We shared, we shared various designs with the congregation. Change can scare. There were multiple reactions. So we had listening sessions to hear all. With adjustments, the plans were heartily embraced by the design committee. These exciting design, nave, and chancel boards from Fleming have sat here before us, as you can see, for all of these, for all of these weeks now, while phase one is moving to completion. We have joined together to believe and work for so much. We have envisioned so much we have asked for so much. We have given so much. Soon we will be welcomed into a beautiful, amazingly grand, and superbly functional design phase one completed. Welcome center offices, space for our ministers and ministry, gym, dining hall, and so much more. And as wonderful and necessary and essential are these new buildings, I deeply and enthusiastically believe we need to finish our vision in the nave and the chancel. I said in the vestry meeting the other night that I did not think I would live to see Notre Dame restored, but I would be deeply sad and disappointment, disappointed if I did not see our chancel enhanced and enriched. Now is the time for that. We have the plans. We say we could do it in years. That would be hard. We probably wouldn't. Judy and I have found a way to give more. So many have given so much. It is not a little that we need to finish, but it's not a lot. I believe by the Spirit of God we want to do this. I believe by the grace of God, we can. Often kneeling in our cherished place and space, we express our gratitudes and our aspirations 
in these wild and wonderful words. I think they are appropriate in the midst of all this. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I give to you our esteemed senior warden and my cherished friend, Mike Murphy. Beautifully done, Dan. Good morning. I need to share with you something that Sandy said to me yesterday when we were talking on the phone. He said, Mike, tomorrow morning is going to be the defining moment in your tenure as senior warden. <laughs> Just, you know, putting pressure on uh, like that. Well, this is not about me, it's about us. Uh, Daniel presented to you uh, the course of how we arrived at where we are today with so many things with the development of the plans for Blaisdell, Greenwood, and the Nave. Uh, to try to say those things in a few words here this morning is to encapsulate hours and hours of time and effort that so many people have put into this and discussions that they've had. And I want to give you, from my perspective, uh, a little bit of a different view of my reactions and my course of working through, especially the nave design. From the very beginning, I had great confidence in whatever would be achieved in Blaisdell and Greenwood. I knew in those program spaces and office spaces that our staff and our parishioners would work together well to come up with a beautiful design, and I think that they have. When it came to the worship space in the nave, as Dan was mentioning, it's our spiritual home. It's where we worship together, where we're bonded together. And that is at a different level of feeling for a lot of us, and it was for me. So in, uh, I, Daniel said, in 2015, the process started, committees were formed. The first time that I saw any of the plans that Terry Bird Eason had prepared was in August of 2016 when some slides were presented. Frankly, I walked out of that meeting and I was shocked. I reacted very negatively to the things that I saw. And who am I to judge what a designer who's done many churches, the National Cathedral, and is renowned in this country for liturgical design, who am I to question that? But I couldn't help but have reactions to certain things that I saw. Uh, when the listening session, well, at that point, the campaign for phase one had started, and I hate to admit it, when I was first approached about it, I was reluctant to even make a pledge because I wanted to see what was going to happen in the nave. But a very wonderful former senior warden reminded me, Mike, this is community. This is about all of us. And at that point, she assured me, as others did, that the process would unfold, that we would have the listening sessions, that we would have time for everyone to give their input, and that is what happened. We started, as Daniel said, with the listening sessions in the nave, when it was attended by a great number of people. But you know, when it comes down to something like that, I think a lot of people are very reluctant to speak out about what they really feel about what the designs were. And I think they were encouraged to, but I went to both of the meetings and tried to express what I felt, but it was a large gathering. From that time and after that was over, I felt like the train was leaving the station and that there would not be additional input to the design. And I spoke to Sandy and, and said, Sandy, I feel like that we need to bring another set of eyes on board, another architectural firm, because frankly, with some of the plans that were being considered at that time, uh, you would have to have a local architecture firm to sign the plans to approve the structural changes and other things that were uh, uh, considered by these plans. So the Fleming firm was brought on at that point as an additional set of eyes and at the as the architects for the project and for the nave. At that point also, 
Sandy initiated meetings for the vestry, the architects, uh, to have their own listening sessions, intense ones where Sandy greatly encouraged everyone to speak up. Say it now. Say what you think about the plans. There were things that I had reacted to that were uh, absolutely beautiful. Uh, uh, if you wanted something that was a bit more formal than what we have. When I came to this church, not only was I thrilled, I was thrilled at the, the camaraderie, the, the joy, the, uh, the faithfulness of the, of the congregation when I came here in 1985, and the architecture of the space of the nave resonated with me. There was something about the simplicity of the Georgian design that simply lifted me when I saw it. What I felt was that when the designs were originally done, they were a bit more of, as Sandy helped me with this, they, maybe they were more New England Georgian, a little bit more embellishments than Southern or Virginia Georgian. And uh, from there, we had the sessions with the vestry participating, and a lot more people spoke up and gave their ideas. What I'm trying to illustrate is that in all this process, Sandy led us through this to let everyone speak, to, let every, to encourage everyone to say what they thought and what they felt about the designs. And he especially allowed me to uh, throw in my opinions. And please don't think that by my standing here or saying that I had objections or I had thoughts about it, that I was trying to say that I knew best. I certainly don't. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And all of us in here, I haven't been in all your homes, but I'm sure that the homes in here are as different as the people in here. We don't want everybody to think the same. Uh, I don't want to be in a place where uh, everyone feels the same about architecture, about theology, or any of that. I like the diversity of opinion. It's one of the reasons I'm here. But we went through this process, and it took a long while. And just imagine how many hours people have spent working on this, considering things for the nave, and building a consensus. And yes, there were some differences of, of opinion. And mine was uh, some of the strongest of that. But we got through it. And Sandy, through all the entire process of what we were doing, listened. He allowed us to talk. Uh, he was so open, so considerate and respectful, patient and thoughtful of everything that we were going through to reach a consensus. He was striving for unanimity because he knew how important it would be for all of us. And I think that what we've arrived at is a wonderful and beautiful plan. Uh, so many people have done so much. We've reached this point in time, and I think it's time for us now to finish the project. When you consider how long it's taken to get us where we are today in the plans, uh, we don't want to start over. You don't want other people looking at it and coming up with new ideas. It takes a long time to draw a consensus like we've drawn. So I hope and pray that from today forward, we can finish the project and get it done. I love this place. It brought me back to the church. And I sincerely hope that we can finalize the plans and complete the NAVE also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Can you all hear me? <laughs> oh, lovely. Some pictures. Um, for those of you that I don't yet have the pleasure of knowing, I'm Ann Morgan, Brookfield Morgan. Having attended Holy Communion since I was four years old, I've spent over 34 years here in this parish. Seeing that I attended St. Mary's and was very active in church and school sports, it's safe to say that I typically was here on campus about seven days a week. I consider Holy Communion home, not only because of the days I have spent in church, chapel, the gym, soccer fields, or on campus, but for many other reasons as well. It is the people, the people here of this parish, that helped mold and encourage the development of my values and morals that my parents had instilled in me. Church of the Holy Communion allowed me to be my own person, to grow in a safe and loving church community, surrounded by unconditional love, filled with warm, considerate, and thoughtful hearts. I am so grateful for the people then and now. I have made lifelong friends here in this parish over time, and today, I continue to have these opportunities through various parish activities, supper club, vestry, more than a meal, greeting, and numerous children's events to continue to make and develop these lifelong relationships. God is 
good. Over 11 years ago, I was married here in this sacred space, and God has since blessed us with two spirited, loving, kind, funny, and all-around great girls, Annalise, who's eight, and Mary Brooks, who's five. You probably see them going during church service <laughs> to put their cans up. Um, it's really wonderful to see them now call this place home as I have for so many years. I'm so grateful for what the parish has done for me, and I'm so appreciative of what it is doing for our girls. I am happy that Michael and I are able to give back to our church home and community. I continue to be amazed at what God has provided. When we were on the search for a new rector, God provided us with a young, well, younger than me, <laughs> priest from up north who had this great pump bumper sticker that read, I wasn't born in the south, but I got here as fast as I could. <laughs> and now... What a gift to Holy Communion and to the Greater West Tennessee Episcopal Church has Sandy been. <laughs> we needed a new gym, and we'd been talking about it for probably the last 20 years or so. Well, our new priest Sandy led the charge. When the fundraising consultants thought best case scenario, we could maybe raise $5 million dollars, well, we raised over six, seven, eight, nine, it goes on. God abundantly provided. When we were thick in the discussions of construction, and many were asking, well, what about the nave? Gifts continued to pour in so that our entire worship space could be glorified and updated to help our church community progress. God continues to provide. Friends, Sandy has led us this far. However, there remains a gap to being able to complete most everything needed and desired. That funding gap is at an achievable distance. The time is ideal to complete the needed updates now. It is imperative that we take advantage of the timing. Raising this money now allows only one displacement for our parish, and having contractors currently on site lessens completion cost. We must, take a, we must take our building project across the finish line. I told you, God is good, and he continues to provide. Well, listen, friends, he isn't quitting, and neither should we. Having raised over $10 million, another 250000 enables us to complete all of the must-dos and most of the want-to-dos. The only unfunded projects, as Sandy mentioned earlier, would be the pews, the sacristy, and the organ, all of which we can readily come back to at a later date. But leaving the narthex or chancel unfinished now will look, well, unfinished. We must step up now to raise the additional $250,000 by June 30th. Now, knowing the generosity of our congregation, you might not be surprised when I tell you that someone in our parish has realized fully the importance of its timing and has offered a challenge grant. That is right. A parishioner has offered to give $100,000 to complete the fundraising if the rest of the congregation can raise the final $150,000 by then. God's gifts keep on coming. This is so exciting. I am so thankful to each and every one of you who has pledged and contributed to the campaign thus far, and I am asking each of you to consider stretching and extending your pledge an additional year or adding on a donation that works for you and your families that can help our incredible congregation finish this race. Looking around, just guessing there may be about 150 people in this room, just to put it into perspective, if each person could put another $500 this year and next, that would get us to the $150,000 needed. That, along with the generous challenge gift, that is, of the $100,000, it would have us achieving our goal and moving forward with the needed updates to our worship space. We should be fully back in our church home on all fronts in early 2020. Y'all, that's like six to eight months away. That's so exciting. <laughs> I ask each of you to pray about this and consider stretching just a little farther. 
Talk with your friends that aren't here today and spread the news. God is good, and he continues to provide. I see our girls continuing to grow here in this community, in this worship space that God has enabled us to create. They have learned to worship here. They're learning to sing and praise the Lord through choir. They're learning to read his word as lectors, celebrating his life through sports teams, and they soon will be acolyting, enjoying youth group, being confirmed, and eventually being married here in this sacred space. I'm sure many of you can relate to these visions for yourselves, your children, or your grandchildren, just as I do. After this last stage and completed construction, we will all be able to focus ever more on our ministry mission and enjoying worshiping back in our updated sacred space. Thank you all for your gifts of time, talent, and treasures. What a wonderful and abundantly giving community we have here at Holy Communion. Thank you all for making it so. Now, I'd like to ask the vestry members um, to rise in support of this. So if you're on vestry, please stand up. <laughs> now, we, the vestry, ask you to please help us get to the finish line and complete the work so we can get back to concentrating on all the wonderful things that our parish has to offer our congregation and our community. Thank you for your prayerful consideration. The time is right. The time is now. We have a few minutes for questions or feedback or comments or anything that someone would like to share. Does anyone want to ask or say? No, 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 hang on. <coughs> Ann Morgan said we could extend our pledge for another year. Um, and that is just adding on or just maybe you could clarify what that means. Well, everybody's been very generous with their pledges so far. If that would be something that you were comfortable um, uh, extending it another year, then we would be very grateful for that. Or if you'd like to change your gift in another way, um, we're grateful to anything to help us get to the finish line. Is that? And technically what that is is that for some people, the original gifts were spread over five years. So if you pledge, say, $10,000 over five years, that would be $2,000 a year for five years. And the uh, extend a year means do that for six years for a total of $12,000. What else? Questions, comments, feedback, please. I've been looking at the plans and the photos for the new nave. And the only reservation or, or question I have is about the floor. I know that the old floor needs some work done on it. I don't know what the new floor is made of. I have heard anywhere from marble to granite to tile to whatever. And to me, it looks very cold and very unfriendly, and I just have a problem with it. Pat, thank you very much for that. Um, Daniel, if you might in just a minute speak to the design elements, I'll answer the factual question that what's shown is a tile floor, uh, which is similar to the material that we have out here. It's got that rough surface to it so that it isn't slippery. Uh, it's also a uh, manufactured product rather than a natural product, which cuts the cost more than in half. Daniel, could you speak to the design elements? In a beautiful, warm and tan color, peaceful, tranquil, Holy Spirit inspired. <laughs> I'll, I'll also draw back to what Mary Ann had offered, uh, that the floor in the children's chapel, which will be opening on June 2nd, is uh, similar to the floor that's planned for the nave, so we will be able to actually see what it looks like rather than needing to go with artists' renderings, which is going to give us a much, better, uh, a much better idea. And if we need to make an alteration, we can, but we'll actually see it in place. Other questions, comments, feedback? 
Sorry to be working from the back here. I can see hands. Charlton. Just to be sure I understand the numbers, we need to raise for both uh, the rep the Blaisdell and Greenwood and the Dave renovations, we need to raise an additional 800,000, just round numbers, to complete both projects. Is that correct? You're adding the two deficits together. There are deficits showing on both projects, and so if you wanted to get to zero balance, you're right. What the vestry has said is that they are comfortable finding a way to cover the deficit on the first over some sort of long-term financing or leveraging the endowment or whatever it might be, but they're not willing to go to 800,000, which is why we're here saying that NAVE number needs to get down pretty close to zero because we're already extended on the first. We're comfortable where we are, but we're not comfortable going further. Is that helpful? Yes. Mike, do you want to speak to that any further as senior warden? I don't. I think that's clearly expressed. What else? Amy. On the projects, the three listed in priority, those are not included for the 250 that we need, right? That is correct. The three uh, numbered projects in the NAVE, Pew, Sacristy, and Organ Improvement, are not covered in the 250. Those would be projects that we would need to continue to go, or maybe a family would want to adopt, or a group of families would want to adopt. But that's something that we can come back and enhance the organ later. We can come back and renovate the Sacristy, which is a discrete space, later. Um, it would be tough to leave the chancel undone. So if we got another 500 Yes, if we got another 500 on top of the 250, we're done. <laughs> what else? Does anyone on the panel want to offer any closing words? It seems like the, the conversation on the floor is concluded. I'll offer some closing words. <laughs> um, I'd like to uh, extend a special thank you uh, to David Dando, who has been our project manager on this. <clears throat> David uh, called me probably two and a half years ago now and said, you're going to need someone to manage this project. You don't know it yet, but you do. And, uh, and he was right. <laughs> he was really right. Um, and, in one measure alone, uh, David has saved us more than $100,000 in uh, sales tax savings alone that he has marshaled through, plus all of the work that he's gone through, <laughs> plus all of the work that he's gone through marshaling our contractors and our architects. David, do you want to offer any reflection on the project or any greeting to the congregation? Let's get this done. Okay. I'm going to kick in some more. Let's all kick in some more. Let's make it work. Okay? I'd like to add one other thing. Let's get the project done so we can free up our rector to do the things that we hired him to do. <laughs> Not to be... <laughs> Not to be the construction manager and to be dealing day by day with so much that pulls him away from his great skill of teaching, preaching, and leading us. So let's set him free and get him back to the, the role that we hired him for. This concludes our uh, season of, um, of adult forums. We've got a few sort of surprise ads coming on, so keep an eye out to the uh, e-communicator for that. We'll also get the summer schedule published soon. Uh, but make sure to mark your calendar for our ribbon cutting on June 2nd when we're going to open up the second and third floor of Blaisdell and Greenwood, uh, and you'll be able to see all of these wonderful things in just a couple of weeks' time. Church starts in just a few minutes, and we'll see you back soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>